Well, how's everyone doing this morning? Let me hear where you're at. Glad that you are here. Met a few new people already this morning. So great to have you here with us. And I, I just want to echo what Rachel just said about five for five. Next week, it is going to be straight fire. Like if I only had five minutes to preach, yeah. trust me, it would be the f like five most fire-filled minutes you'd ever heard. And so we got five people that only have five minutes. It is going to be, you probably want to come wearing like a fire suit next week. It's going to be intense. Uh, it's going to be so good. And uh, we're just excited for it, looking forward to it. I'm going to be sitting in the front row taking notes next week. We are in, as Rachel said, uh, week number 11 of this series on the book of Galatians. Uh, and I, I hope that you have been able to enjoy your summer. I hope that you have vacated at some point over the summer. But just by chance, you're like a fall vacation person or a spring vacation person. Anyone been here for all 11 weeks of this series? Let me see a hand if you've been here all 11 weeks. Oh, come on. Let's give it up for these guys. These are like the fall vacationers. They deserve a prize or a medal or something. Y'all deserve one. I mean, it's, it's, let's just dive into God's Word. Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse number 1. And uh, we're going to read 13 verses of, of this chapter. We're actually going to press thematically, largely, into the first verse. This is what the Bible says. The Apostle Paul writes, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he's obligated to keep the whole... Law. Of course, I just need to pause right there in case this is your first Sunday in church. Why is Paul talking about circumcision? Why are we talking about circumcision in church? This group of churches that Paul is writing to were a group of churches that he started. He started these churches, and now for two years he's been away from them. He's not seen them face to face. And in that, in that period of time, some other false teachers have come in, and they have begun to teach a different message, that these Galatian Christians need to uphold the entire Mosaic Law if they want to be followers of Jesus Christ, and Paul is writing to vehemently oppose that message. He's saying things that they are telling them they need to do, like to be circumcised or to obey food laws. Paul is saying, no, Christ has so fulfilled the law in his perfect life and sinless death that you are free from the law. We're going to press into that a little bit more this morning. In fact, if you want more on the relationship of a Christian to the law of the Old Testament, week number three of this series was a great week that you, you might want to go and, and check out. Uh, you can check out the podcast. We've got the video messages online. Uh, and so if you want more on that, you can look at week number three. But let's read on. Verse four says, You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we eagerly uh, wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. We're going to press more into that concept next week as we look at that verse, as well as a verse further down where he talks about through love, serving one another. Actually, not week, that's a high five, or five for five. But the week after that, we will be coming back, diving into the Galatians series. Verse seven, you are running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view. And the one who's troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish that those who would unsettle you would emasculate themselves, for you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Can we pray one more time and ask God to just take his word? Apply it to our hearts. Lord, we thank you for your presence in this place already. What a great God you are. We worship you in this place. And now, God, I pray for every hearer in this room today, myself included. We are listening to your word. We are listening to your spirit. We are leaning in, God, to get closer to you. And we just want to see Jesus high and lifted up, glorified in this place and in our lives. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. 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 As Rachel mentioned, the title of the series is Imagine the Freedom. Imagine the Freedom. And uh, you might recognize that as the slogan of Lotto 649. Uh, we name our messages around here on Lotto things and just different things like that. So Lotto 649, and I grew up before we, you know, we used, to, we used to have commercials. I know some of you young people, you don't know what commercials are. But we used to have these things called commercials. They were about 30 seconds long, and it was like when companies would try to tell you that what they were doing was good. A lot of 649 commercials, they, they were some good commercials. They would just say, like, imagine the freedom, the song would say. And then you'd see, like, 
you'd see people taking off in their private plane, you would see people jet skiing, uh, you would see, you know, someone driving a Ferrari, you'd see a couple horseback riding on the beach, like anything that you could think of uh, uh, that would look really free, that's what you would see in these commercials. And so I, I beg the question, what do you see as freedom? What would be your commercial? If you just had 30 seconds to be like, this is the most freeing stuff, like for me, this is the pinnacle of freedom, what would be your commercial? For some, you might be like a, a thrill seeker, and so you would just want to be dropping in on a double black dime, and you're just ready to go. That's freedom to you. And maybe for you, you're, you're an introvert, and for you, your commercial would just be like an empty room. You would just be like, this is it, <laughs> right here, glory to God. I remember for me, one of the most freeing feelings in my life was uh, the feeling of walking out of my last university undergrad exam. I mean, I felt, I mean, I remember that moment, right? Like, like I, it's almost like I'm in that moment right now. When I think about it, I still get chills. Like, I'm getting chills right now. Just pause. I'm gonna wait. Okay. You remember your last exam. You remember that last paper. You remember these kind of free moments in your life. And... What's interesting is that here in Galatians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul is writing to these Galatian Christians, and he is uh, equivocating a life of faith with true and complete and utter freedom. And it's not what a lot of people think about freedom. Like, I imagine when they were doing a lot of 649 commercials, there wasn't like three people on the corner of the room who were like, hey guys, we're missing an idea, you know, like... What we really need to show in this commercial is the inside of a church. Like, like, I know we've got a lot of good things, but we just need to show someone in church. Then people will really know it's free. And of course they didn't do that. Of course, and I think they should have, right? They never came to Resonate Church. That's fine. But, but, I, but I can understand how people don't see that as a life of faith. Yet Paul is saying here, the very thing that will lead to true and authentic freedom is nothing less than a face-to-face -face relationship with God. What Paul is saying is that everything that God has done for you through Christ Jesus was done for your freedom. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Now this concept of freedom in relationships, freedom in relationship with God, what I want to do this morning is I want to kind of paint the picture of how relationships are freeing, and then kind of draw that back around to how our relationship with God is freeing. So how relationships are freeing. I did a wedding last week, and uh, we, we love this couple. They're a great couple. Some of you know the wedding were there last week. Um, I believe they're going to have an amazing uh, marriage. But if you listen to their vows, you would not say that what they were engaging into was a picture of freedom. Like, if you listen to their vows, they were giving up individual freedoms to take on responsibilities of love. So you wouldn't say, oh yeah, that sounds like, so relationships don't appear to us on the outside to be super freeing. Like, you think about the relationship with your kids, right? I mean, no one has ever thought, you know, when I have a baby, I'm going to be free one day. <laughs> no one's ever thought that. I mean, there's beauty in the relationship. It's fantastic. But no one says, that's when I'm going to be free. No, relationships, we don't really see them as, as freeing. But the reality is this. The deepest desire that you have in your heart is the, is the desire to be fully seen and yet fully loved. Yeah. Yeah. That someone would see everything that you are and just still like love every part of you. That's the deepest desire God wired into your heart. That only, we only discover that in relationships. Thus, freedom only comes through relationships. The true freedom, the, the, the freest we could ever be through a relationship with God. Because no person, even if you had someone uh, that, that really loved you, there's no way that they could, no matter how many years you spent together, know everything there is to know about you. And even if they could, there's no way that another human being could, in that space of seeing everything that you are, fully love you unconditionally. That's why Paul says the only place of true freedom is in a face-to-face -face relationship with God, face to face, where you realize everything that Paul says about the gospel, that there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus, that your sins can no longer separate you from God, that he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Yeah. The gospel brings us to a place where we're able to stand before a holy God, face to face, and be fully known and be fully loved. Yeah. It's the freest place in the world. Paul holds that up for us in verse number one. He emphatically says, and I'll read it again, it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. He says, stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Christ has set us free. This is the theme 
of this entire letter, that you are free in Jesus Christ. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you are free. And not free in the external lot of 649 cents. Like, you could... Freedom is not external. Freedom's internal. If you took a bound person and you gave them a billion dollars, they would not become free. And on the other hand, if you took someone who's free in their soul and you took away everything they had, they would not cease to be free. Freedom that God has for us desires for you to live it. In fact, Paul has said that he has called you to freedom. It's in his plan for your life. You might not feel it this morning, but understand that God is calling us to a deeper place of freedom. Just turn to your neighbor and say, live free. Turn to the other side and say, get free. It's always hard to do that. You don't know which way to turn. Everyone turns the opposite way. You just said that to someone's back twice. So this is a transition sentence. It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Do not let yourself become slaves again. This transition sentence is going to lead us into the close of this, of this great letter that Paul writes. And the close of the letter is this practical section. Paul is going to be talking about things that we actually need to engage in in our Christian faith. What, what does freedom look like when lived out? He's going to talk about, you know, this is, this is how, what you do when you've got a friend that's going through a difficult time. And this is how you live generously. Uh, you know, this is the fruit of your life that your life should demonstrate. And Paul is going to lead us into uh, how we practically live out our faith. Now, what's interesting to me is that it would not seem to me that if you wanted to start a section on practical living, if you wanted to get someone to engage in doing something for God, it seems somewhat odd to me that you would actually start by saying you're free. Like, it, you're free from doing anything to try and please God now go and do these things, right? That doesn't seem to line up. It's like if you were to say to your kids, you know, um, if you wanted your kids to eat broccoli and carrots, you know it's good for them, and that's, so that's what you want them to engage in doing. You would probably not say to your kids, hey, you know what, you're free to eat whatever you want. At least not my kids, right? Like, that's, I don't know what your kids are like. But if you want them to eat healthy, you wouldn't just be like, hey, be free. <laughs> no, I, might, I don't know about you, but our, our kids, Alessia would eat Cheerios. And Abby would go straight to the freezer and, and give herself some ice cream. That's what we, if they were free. And so we think, well, how then, why is Paul starting out saying, you're free? And now here's what practical Christian living looks like. You know, if you're in university and you were to say, you know, you're teaching a class, you're going to say, hey, students, guess what? Just the grade you get, it's not going to matter. The employers aren't going to care. You're still going to get the exact same job and live the exact same life. Like, no one is going to work hard. So then it is odd to me that Paul is starting this section on practical living by reminding these Galatian believers that you're free from the law. That you'll never have to pay another price. That you have been declared free. What Christ did on the cross was everything that needed to be done for your freedom. That there's nothing that you can do through your works to add to the freedom that Christ paid for on the cross. You have been declared righteous in the sight of God. And it is imputed righteousness, not on the basis of what I do, not on the basis of my efforts, but on the basis of who Jesus is. There's never another price to be paid for my sins. How is that the starting point? Paul is saying that that is the impetus, that that is the incentive to go and do right living, that that's the incentive for a life of sacrifice, that that's the incentive for a life of radical generosity, that that's the incentive for a life of holiness. You are free. Free in Paul bottom lines it right here. Live free. Now, what I find interesting at the end of this verse is that Paul says... Uh, uh, stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again, again, to a yoke of slavery. Again, again, that's such a strange word. Do not submit again to a, a, a yoke of slavery. And we talked about this in chapter 4. Why is he saying again? Because it kind of doesn't make sense, right? Remember the context. These Galatian believers had been pagan, engaged in a fully pagan lifestyle apart from God. They had had sex with whoever they wanted to have sex with. They had done whatever they wanted to do with their money. In fact, there's the real immoral, cruel parts of their culture that they, that they likely, some of them may have even participated in, which is the discarding of infant girl babies in favor of young boys. There wasn't just a 
little bit of immorality in the pagan culture that they had been saved out of. And that, no doubt, we could, you know, we're in a room, a, a, a room um, of, uh, we're in a church room, and so likely a lot of us could nod our heads and say, yeah, that sounds like slavery. Paul says, don't return again to a yoke of slavery. But what they're doing is they're not going back to paganism. They're trying to live out the whole Mosaic law. The, the false teachers aren't saying, go back and live your old life again. Go back to slavery. No, they're saying, you come out of slavery by living out these laws. And Paul is saying, that's just as much slavery as what you do. If we you know, understand, the implication of what Paul is saying is audacious. Paul is saying that if you obey God for the wrong reasons, it's just as bad as no obedience at all. Go back again, Paul. What we did before was crazy messed up. What do you mean go back again to slavery? We're trying to do our best to follow the law. Paul says, if you're doing that out of the reasons of trying to get to God, you are abandoning the grace of the cross of Jesus Christ, and you are as just as much a slave as you have ever been. No, you, I'm going to, Paul's going to, listen, Paul, Paul's going to talk about holy right living. Listen, Paul calls sin, sin. Paul points to stuff that should be out of their lives. Don't, don't, don't. The, the, the false teachers, it, weren't, it wasn't that they weren't saying that Jesus was important. And it's not that Paul wasn't saying that the cross, or that Paul wasn't saying that there, that there is anything like sin or anything that would pull you away from God. No, and it's not just a balance. It's not just like, well, we need to lean further towards grace. No, it's not balance at all. It's the reasons. It's the underpinning. Yeah. What is going on in your heart? Are you obeying God because you think that's how you get to God? Are you obeying God because you think that's how you're going to get free? Are you obeying God because you think that's going to lead you to a better lifestyle? Paul is not trying to say that you need to, uh, uh, you need to follow some more stuff. Just lean further that way. He's saying, listen, if you do it for the wrong reasons, it's slavery. Only impetus for righteous living is seeing the God who gave everything for you. And when you see him, you say to yourself, I want to be like him. Yeah. That's the impetus for righteous living that the Bible holds out for us. You know what we find it, honestly, I've been, I've been I've grown up in church my whole life, and I love the churches I grew up in, and I love, I've heard so much good Bible teaching. Understand, it is it, it, preachers and myself, we find it hard to press into the level of freedom that the Bible talks about. Because we're like, what if we if, what if I preach that? Like, what will people do? Does, any, like, does that seem like an impetus to understand when we see Jesus? And Paul's going to tell us how we, how we get free. I want to talk a little bit about this freedom. Like what, what, what freedom is not, we've kind of said it a little bit, what freedom is, what it feels like inside, and then how do we get free? How do we get free? So again, here's, here's what freedom is not. Freedom is not the ability to do what I want to do when I want to do. And that's what most of us think freedom is, right? Like, we're like, if I could just do what I want to do when I want to do it, then I am I'm free. And that is not freedom at all. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you. Have you ever realized that the things that you desire often conflict with one another? Like, for example, you're like, I want to have a great career, and I want to make a lot of money. And I want to have a great family, and I want to spend a lot of time with like if, if you were like, someone said, you're free to do whatever you want to do. That's not freedom. I'm conflicted. Yeah. I want to do this, and I want to do that, and I don't know how to choose between the two. The freedom to do whatever you want to do is no better than that. That's, that's bondage, because you don't know what you want to do. You don't know what you want. You can, let me give you a personal example. Uh, Rach and I, we're big believers in counseling. She's a therapist, um, so no doubt. Um, so we can both go to counseling personal, and as a couple, we're big believers in it. Uh, and so I'll just share a little bit of my own journey, kind of some stuff I've discovered in that space. What I used to think when I got stressed out, like what I needed was like a, a couple hours, or maybe even a whole night of just watching TV. Just like I got to, I'm so stressed, I just got to turn my brain off. I just need to escape it all. I just need some space. I just need to go into like kind of that place of thinking about nothing. And you can tell how stressed out I was by what I was watching. Like if I was watching stand-up comedy, um, I was a little stressed out. But if I was watching stuff blow up, I was pretty stressed out. <laughs> I 
used to think that that's what I thought. So if you had said to me, you're free to do whatever you want, you know what I would have done? I would have watched TV. You know how free that would have been for me? How, like, how much that would have relieved stress? I actually found very little. I would escape it for a while, but I would still be stuck in it when the show was over. What I've discovered from that journey and from you know, having great conversations with great people is that the thing I need to deal with stress in my life is not to escape stress for a couple hours. It's actually, what actually helps me, and this is me, not you, this is what works for me, what I actually need is conversations, great conversations with people that I love and trust. Really good, deep, meaningful conversations. That actually frees me up. It actually brings me to a place where I get free. And so if you were to say to me, listen, Freedom, freedom is not the ability to do what you want to do because you don't even know half the time what it is that's going to make you feel free. Sometimes, you know, one day you're going to want this, one day your, your desires are going to point you all, and that's why the freedom to do whatever you want to do is not pure freedom. That's not what the Bible holds up there. So they, then the Galatians, the Galatians had tried that as freedom in their paganist ways. They, that's what they tried. Just do whatever you want to do, whenever you want to do it. It did not get them where they wanted to be. Now, so now they're falling under the teaching of these false teachers, and the false teachers are leading them to another space, and that's that if you do these things, you'll be free. And again, the Bible's holding up for us that trying to do these things to get free will not be free. And why? Because you can't live up to that. If you try to do these things to get free, you'll never feel free because you can't do those things to get free. You just you can't trust yourself. And so if doing what I want is not freedom and trying to do some specific stuff and following this law to get freedom is not freedom, then what is freedom? That's what Paul says. Verse number five, he says, through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. There's a lot of stuff in there. So let's break it down. Through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. First of all, Paul says, through the Spirit. Through the Spirit. This is so important. We can't get to, we can't get to freedom in our lives without the help of the Holy Spirit. Because the work that needs to happen is not that I need to be able to do whatever I want, and not that I need to try and tick some boxes to get free. What I need is an internal move of the Spirit of God in my life that actually changes the things that I want. My desires are conflicted. I could never get them to all line up. But I need the Spirit of God to come and actually give me the heart and mind and purposes of the one who made me and knows what's going to free me. No, we need the Spirit of God. And then Paul says that puts us in a posture of eagerly waiting for the hope of righteousness. The hope of righteousness. The Bible doesn't use the word hope the way we use hope. We're like, I hope I get that job, or I hope. I hope I can buy a BMW today. I hope it's hope is uncertainty in our language. And that's not how the Bible uses hope. When the Bible talks about hope, it talks about absolute certainty that in your future God's going to do something. So when Paul talks about hope here, the hope that we have of righteousness and eagerly waiting for it, what Paul is talking about is the certainty of freedom that you can stand before God fully seen and fully loved. When Paul talks about the hope of your righteousness, that's the hope he's talking about. The hope that right now today, by faith in Jesus Christ, I can stand before a radically, completely holy creator of the universe who made me, who is absolutely holy and absolutely perfect. I can stand before that God face to face without shame because of the fullness of what Jesus did for me. That's the assurance I can stand in today, but Paul says we're eagerly awaiting another one, uh, the future hope. And what is that? That's when you're actually face to face with God and in that place of truly actually being seen by God, you know that you can have hope. Hope today. Assurance. That's the beautiful thing about Christianity. No other religion gives you certainty like this. Every other religion is like, if you can live up to it. Here's the bar. Now try to get there. And Christianity says Jesus did it all. You stand before God fully loved by an act of miraculous grace. Fully seen and fully loved. That's freedom. It's the freedom that your heart is always long for. So it's interesting then to me that Paul closes out this text with a verse that kind of comes out of nowhere. In verse 11, he's going to talk about freedom. He's going to get to the practical stuff. But then he drops this verse here at verse 11. And he says, 
If I still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. The offense of the cross. The offense of the cross. We're going to have the band come back. They're going to lead us in just a couple moments in just this amazing song they led us in this morning about freedom. But first, as they're coming, I want to talk about the offense of the cross. Freedom of the cross and the offense of the cross. Like, these things don't seem to go together, right? Like, the freedom, it's so beautiful, it's so wonderful, and yet the offense of the cross. What is Paul talking about when he's talking about the offense of the cross? The beauty of it, you can stand face to face with the holy God, be fully seen and fully loved because of what Jesus has done for you. Faith in him. And yet, what's, then what's the offense of the cross? See, the cross is offensive. You don't get to the internal beauty of the cross without going through the offense of the cross. You don't get to that internal place of complete freedom without going through the offense of the gospel, the offense of the cross. And the offense of the cross is this, is that you are so far from God, so utterly incapable of living up to who God is on your own, so utterly incapable of getting there yourself, of living pure, of living for God. You're so... Listen, I'm going to have to turn it around to me. We're so messed up in our own hearts and flesh that it took nothing less than the death of the Son of God to free us. And if you don't find that offensive, Paul says you should. It's the offense of the cross. We have to walk through it. We have to walk through our own failing, our own hopelessness apart from God. To get to the internal freedom that God is not going to condemn you, that he's not rejecting you, that he loves you, that you don't have to worry today if God is mad at you. You don't have to worry today if he's got a frown on his face towards you. No, the, the, the beauty of the internal beauty of the, of the cross is having come through the cross, fully dependent on Jesus Christ for my salvation. I stand before God free. But you got to go through the offense of the cross to get so how do we get free? How do we get free? Like, how do we get to that place where we just totally, like, free from, let's get practical, free from the comparisons that you line yourself up with somebody else and say, how oh, about I can get there? And then when you can't get there, you just get angry at all the stuff that stays in your way. Oh, yeah, but the deck was stacked against me, and life's been tough, and so I'm just going to go through life frustrated. And so we're, we're, we're bound up inside. Like, I don't feel... Free. How do we get free? How do we get free from our sin and our shame and our past? How do we get free from the stuff that someone said to you this week that just ate away at you because it was hurtful and painful? How do we get free of that stuff? Paul says you've got to go through the offense of the cross to get the freedom of the gospel. The offense of the cross. We've got to stand in the place of the shadow of the cross and know it's nothing but. Paul is going to close this out over these coming weeks and he's going to be talking about practical living. Listen, we're going to be diving in like what does it look like? What does it look like? Practical outworkings of the gospel. What are they? But one more time before we close out this kind of great section now of doctrine and the transition point, Paul is saying, you need to stay free. So I'm going to invite you all over the room to stand with us. The band's already been leading us in a song of freedom this morning. And I'm just going to invite you to posture your heart before God. To stand today in the shadow of the cross. God, we come to you today by grace in the name of Jesus. Christ, and we stand in the shadow of the cross. It's in this place, God, where all of our fears and insecurities get, get washed away. It's in this place that because of the sacrificial blood of your son, Jesus Christ, God, we are free. We, we walk through the offense 